I like that late uh, late Victorian description in newspapers for a religious maniac. It'll say, you know, a, a, a report will say something like crazed on the subject of religion. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. As if right. it's sort of like only on that are they crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I, I think it's a, it's a great issue in the 19th century, I mean, that relationship between religion and madness, um, especially in the American context where there is, there's a, a long history, especially among European observers, to think that religious insanity is especially prominent in the United mm. States because there's all these crazy sectaries. So, they, you know, it's got to, you know, what makes, what, what explains that? Why is there so much right. religious madness? And, um, well, and also in eras, it seems like there's a kind of punctuated equilibrium to the arc of American religious history. The 1830s is a time of a lot of, you know, right. upheaval, ferment, whatever, and then the 1890s, and she fits into this. She's almost like Woody Allen's uh, Zelig, <laughs> who is part of all these different movements and things and just sort of weaves in and out. Right, <laughs> right. Stuff. Yeah, no, that that's right. I mean, he's, religiously, she is... Uh, she is a, is a wonderful embodiment of, you know, one innovation after another mm -hmm. in the period. Um, you know, so I, I spend a, a chapter on just trying to think through all of the different uh, religious uh, innovations she embodies and the kind of how she, she works this through. I mean, she grows up within, a, you know, within a, at least vaguely Methodist world, going to mm -hmm. camp meetings. Like the Ocean, Ocean Grove. Grove. Yeah. You know, ends up in Quaker schools and kind of working her way in these kind of Philadelphia liberal Quaker circles, reform circles, and then uh, Unitarian, uh, free thinker, uh, active in secular circles, at least in that meaning in terms of really strict state church state separation, mm -hmm. and then a spiritualist, and then a new thought person, and then a little interest in theosophy, um, you know, finally gets interested in. in, in uh, being an oriental psychic uh, mm -hmm. rather than an uh, occidental medium as she sees it. And so she starts, you know, dabbling with uh, yoga as it was um, it almost makes in the period. So, see, yeah, so it's, you know, it's a little bit of everything. And I agree, the 1890s are just an incredibly fertile decade Yeah. that way. Um, yeah, it is like the 1830s. Um, there are a lot of fertile decades in American yeah, religious sure. history, but I, I, I think the 1890s are... are, are are a great decade. She also, her. she's, she has the ingoing, in, it's her story how it's connected to all these different webs in a way, of religious webs. She's, it's like a 1960s phenomenon too, or a sort of baby boom, you know, experimentation, going, grabbing right. this and that, and changing right, with right, right. every year. Yeah, yeah, I mean that, uh, yeah, there are these, these, uh, wonderful seekers, inquirers in the period. I mean, there, Craddock's one of them. I mean, there are certainly any number of others. I, I worked a little bit on this uh, uh, figure uh, in the same period, Sarah Farmer, who founded a religious community in uh, Elliott, Maine, who similarly personifies that, that questing, that, that ever creative merging of different hmm. spiritual traditions. So, so you know, you have some of them, and it does anticipate what we tend to think of as a post-60s seeker phenomenon, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, that sense of religious eclecticism, right. mixing lots of different traditions of... Um, yeah, yeah, of, right, of being an endless seeker. And that that's, mm -hmm. so we tend to think of that proteanness as something that's particularly marked since the 1960s. And mm -hmm. you know, there's some pretty good statistical measures to say it has become more marked. But there are these prototypes um, and uh, who give us some sense of uh, this uh, creativity and experimentation um, long before we uh, begin to notice it so much. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, finally, I just wanted to ask you um, about your, this project is done, it's getting ready to come out, the book is getting ready to come out. Is there anything that you're working on right now? Are you taking a breather? Or? <laughs> I have 
You know, for a long time I've been saying that I'm working on a history of the field. I mean, of, of, every, of the history of, of how religion has been studied in American culture, and not only in terms of, you know, the univer research university or um, the development of religious studies, but really thinking about, again, the, you know, the amateur figures, all of these different places that religion is getting picked up as an object of study before we, you know, we... Uh, have a recognized field for it. Mm -hmm. And so that first chapter in the Craddock book where I'm looking at her as a scholar, as an intellectual, and the kinds of questions about religion that intrigue her and other um, figures in the period, is the kind of project I, I think I'm working on. <laughs> I've certainly been collecting a lot of material. I've, uh, in some ways, I thought I was working on that, and then I got to working on the Karatek even more and wanted to really tell that story and thought it was something I could do um, uh, effectively. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other is just a big, massive kind of project. You know, this is like from the early modern world into the early 20th century, and the characters are vast, the issues are innumerable, the fields of inquiry are all over the place. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm not limiting myself to uh, the classical religious studies fields of the 19th century, theology, church history, biblical studies, but really trying to think about, well, where did these, all these other things that we now consider part of the field, where were they getting studied, by whom, uh, and so forth. So. So that's one of the things I've been working on. Um, and one other thing that flows from the, from the Craddock work, because she was so involved in uh, free thinking circles in the American Secular Union, I've become very interested in um, where that impulse leads in the 20th century. And you know, part of that is because we live with such um, vociferous and uh, best-selling uh, atheists out there in the last decade that we've, we've, uh, we've become very intrigued by the new atheism. And uh, you know, one of the things I was dealing with with, with, the, Craddock was just, with the Craddock material was this, this American Secular Union, which she was in the leadership of for a couple of years and heavily involved in. And so what these agnostic, uh, rationalistic figures were doing in that period, what they stood for, um, and then where they ended up in, say, the 1920s and 30s, uh, you know, and beyond, so that there's a kind of history there that I've, I've become intrigued by um, this American Association for the Advancement of Atheism, which was founded in the 1920s, collected some stuff on them. Don't know where all this is headed, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm, those, are, those are two of the areas, in other words. So a, a history of the study of the field, and then this history of secularism, unbelief, atheism, uh, is another area. And uh, so, no, I'm not really taking much of a breather, but I can't say I'm making just massive strides on other those projects right now mm -hmm. either. But uh, there's some ferment, though. So that's, that's what I'm up to. Well, thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you.